I'm Mark Chapman, as I think most of you know. Uh, Rick is uh, sorry not to be here. He's preaching at another church this morning. Uh, but we'll be talking today about salt and light in education. And I'll be making a few comments briefly. And after that, the majority of our time will be spent uh, with a panel discussion with uh, Aaron Donnie, Maddie, Jenny Edith, Jen Ritzma, and Bruce Rotman. By the way, I hope you're all here because I haven't actually checked. <laughs> so uh, I'll have you guys up in, in, a, in a bit. Uh, I wanted to take a moment, maybe at the beginning here, to uh, dismiss a widely held misconception that a lot of our culture believes today. Um, have Christians, in fact, been salt and light in education historically? Have we really contributed to the growth of education? Now? Or, I mean, has the church opposed you know, the advancement of learning over the centuries, the press, science, and all the rest? Um, that's the question I think that is worthy of just briefly considering because as you engage with others in the culture, you want to make sure that they understand that Christianity uh, in its best expression by far is a supporter of education. It's much less suppressing it. Uh, so don't let anybody tell you that Christianity has held back, whoops, where did I go there? Uh, that Christianity has held back, I'm explaining my surprise there. Uh, so this is Harvard Yard, and of course, Harvard, like most of our earliest and top schools, were originally made to train graduates and to train ministers. And if you look at uh, you know, the Christian motivation to support, expand education has a very long history. And all these Ivy League schools, even though they're today secular universities, were not started as secular universities. They were established by Christians. And really, if you look at all of our earliest educational institutions uh, in our nation today, uh, they were founded by Christians, the vast majority of them. And a lot of them set out to train ministers and later undergraduates. But throughout the 18th and, and, and throughout the 19th century as well, the most learned group of people in our country were clergy. Uh, they often led the way, not only in teaching and learning, but also not in, uh, Christian faith, but also about the world, about scientific developments. They followed science. People like Jonathan Edwards were very interested uh, in learning more about our world, about nature. Um, so sometimes in my theology classes at Marquette, I use this illustration. All right, here we are. March Madness, we all know what that is, right? And it's kind of fun to look at the bracket of March Madness. This is from, a, not this year, but a few years back. And if you look at all these schools, a random set of 64 schools, well, they're not random. They all played well and got in, but there's 20 private schools that are a part of these, this tournament that year. 20 private schools. Now. Out of those universities, how many of those schools do you think were started by Christians? Who thinks five or less? How about 10 or less? 15, is that enough? Nobody's raising their hand here. 20? I mean, you're going with 20, I'm right, you guys. Um, it's actually not 20, it's 19, all right? 19 of those schools, just to happen to be in the tournament that year, 19 of those schools, their roots are Christian groups, Christian individuals, Christian de denominations. And it's a pretty remarkable thing. So the idea that Christianity suppresses learning is a fairly ridiculous one when it comes down to it. Can we find pockets of Christians in various times in history that have done that? Sure. But in the main, that's not the case at all. Uh, and this actually goes back further. So if you look at the Middle Ages, and you look at what's happened in Europe over the period of the, of the Middle Ages and the, uh, the growth of scientific studies and especially astronomy, the growth of the university system, that was fueled by the church. And you know, the College of Sorbonne, which became the University of Paris, uh, one of the most influential early universities, Oxford, Cambridge, all the earliest universities, uh, which started, by the way, as early as 11 to 1200, uh, year 11 to 1200, roughly, is when they were developing. And then even before that, monasteries. Hopefully I'm on track here, yeah. Uh, monasteries were centers of learning. 
Matter of fact, after the fall of Rome, during a period of time when, you know, civilization was struggling a bit with all the disorder that that fall of Rome brought, monasteries became centers of learning and preservers of knowledge, uh, very important centers that helped to maintain our capacity to continue to, to be, uh, have knowledge, to educate, to grow. And, you know, as Christians, we're all called to learn, right? And so Jesus, of course, summarized the law, love the Lord your God with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and with all your heart. Um, love God with our minds. I mean, that means learning, right? And we learn more and more about our God, about the scriptures, about faith, about living out what that looks like. Uh, but education isn't just about teaching Christianity, of course, or theology, in which I teach. Uh, the world is God's creation. And when we work in other fields like the sciences, we're honoring Christianity and we're honoring God. And we can find new reasons to praise him. When you look at figures throughout history, even in the sciences and the astronomy, uh, these were people that were motivated by their faith to study, to learn, to teach. Uh, and you know, we're never going to love our neighbor well or care for this creation uh, if we don't learn how to care for them. So we worship a God of truth, but truths require education. Now as Reformed folk, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, so I just felt compelled I had to say that all, but uh, we are in a tradition that's always valued that kind of rich intellectual work for the glory of God, and I'm, I'm thankful for, for that. Um, so how do we be salt and light in education? Uh, people have answered that question in a variety of ways, some of those more helpfully than others. And you know, the answer is not simple uh, because education occurs across an enormous spectrum of situations, of topics. What's salt and light in one context might very well be vinegar in another. And so we have to be careful about how we talk. And we can lose our saltiness too, right? I mean, just how salty should we be anyway? Uh, so I think it's helpful to also think about when we think about education, that there's you know, two basic scenarios, I think, for us as Christians. And one is education for Christians. You know, we teach differently when we're teaching a Christian group than we're teaching a non-Christian non group. And, you know, we have the call to renew our minds, and we have that idea that we are able, thankfully, to, you know, integrate faith and learning in a Christian context in a way that we can't do in a lot of other situations. And we can have some common assumptions with our students, you know, as we teach. And when we go to teaching uh, for non-Christians, well, that gets a little trickier. Oops, uh, oh, sorry. Um, you can, uh, you know, we're, yes, we're meant to be salt and light. We need to be salt and light. But you know what? We can oversalt things, right? And if we oversalt things, people are not going to eat it, <laughs> uh, just like in real life. So, you know, there's a, a care that we have to take, there's judgments we have to make about our audience, about what we share with them, about, you know, kind of what the entry points are to provide uh, that salt and light. There's kind of this subtle integration. We have to make different assumptions about our audiences, what they hear and how they will hear it, because they will hear things differently than we might anticipate or, or than a Christian uh, uh, audience would hear it. And we have to really pay attention to how we say it. We're not in combat when we teach. You know, we're not culture warriors when we teach. We're engaging people and wanting to have them be able to engage back in a, in a two-way conversation, really. Uh, we may be in combat in spiritual terms, but in the teaching context, these are people we want to make contact with that we want to impact. And so we need to be careful uh, and also, I think, loving. You know, the way you, know, you listen to your, to your class. You grow from your class. Education is a two-way street, and that's one of the differences between you know, education and preaching. There were a couple times today I wanted to ask Peter a question in the middle of the sermon, but that wouldn't be appropriate, right? Uh, maybe if we were a less formal church, we could have shouted a couple things out, but um, you know, preaching is a different task than teaching. Uh, and that's really true for both of these categories, whether you're in a, in a Christian context or not. Uh, and you learn and you listen from your students and you learn about their assumptions, you learn about their backgrounds. You do that in order to first of all understand them better and to teach them better. But it's also because when you teach, any good teacher knows, you learn, of course, from your students. 
And every semester, I learn all kinds of things from my students. I learn about my I learn about our culture. I learn about what's going on in our culture. I learn about more about how people think and different ways to think and look at things. And so. I think that one way to have a formative kind of teaching, I mean, one's more about formation, and the second group is really more about planting seeds, uh, both in what we say and, in, and, how, and what we teach, but also in how we treat and approach uh, our students, how we embody love for them. Because even if we have nothing in the content of our presentation that's directly you know, Christian, we can embody a different way of dealing with them, of uh, engaging with them, and, and really embodying Christ's love for them in the ways that we teach. All right, well, I don't think I have anything else here. No. So I, what we're going to do next for the rest of the time is just spend some time with a panel. We've got some wonderful people uh, in our congregation. Um, actually, a lot of, uh, why don't you guys come on up, uh, Aaron, Maddie, Jen, and Bruce. Um, and we'll set you guys up. And as they're doing that, yeah, maybe I'll just remind all of you, we've got a lot of other educators, you know, probably in this room, certainly in this church. So, you know, feel free to jump in with contributions of your own, especially when we get to the Q&A. I think that would be a, a nice expansion of, of the conversation. All right, well, uh, your mics, you can just flip them on when you want to talk and flip them off again. Uh, why don't we start, maybe each of you could just introduce yourself, uh, tell us where you work, tell us you know, what kind of institution it is that you work at, whether it's private or public or you know, overtly Christian or not, and what your job is. So go ahead and start. Is it? Okay, there we go. Um, so I am Erin Donnelly. Um, I teach third and fourth grade um, at a public charter school in Milwaukee. Um, and this is my second year teaching, so I'm still pretty new to this. Um, I'm Maddie Jenninga. I teach high school math, um, pre-calculus and pre-algebra, so mainly with seniors and freshmen um, at St. Augustine Prep um, on the south side of Milwaukee, uh, which is a newer school. It's not Catholic. It's not denominational. Um, and yeah, I've been teaching for two years. Jen Ritzma, and I am the learning support coordinator, um, working mainly with our middle school uh, students at Brookfield Christian. Bruce Rotman, and I think I might be possibly the oldest person here. Uh, I'm in my 43rd year of teaching, so I've taught in um, all private schools, um, many Christian schools, and right now I'm at Brickfield Academy one more time, so which is a private, independent, um, not quite Christian school. Well, <laughs> not quite Christian. <laughs> That's, that's actually often uh, an appropriate classification, actually, if you know anything about schools. Uh, maybe you can tell us, hey, how, do you, how did God call you to this kind of career path? If you, want to kind of, you can start. In fact, you just, you're at the end of a long road. Um, when I, I think when I was in high school, I was really interested in, in big ideas and history. I, you know, I used to read Arnold Toynbee's The Study of History, and I was actually very interested in... in um, helping poor people, and that kind of motivated me to become a history major, and then economics and government, and uh, um, so that, uh, when I was a tiny little kid, I would preach to my friends, so it's either preacher or teacher, one of the two, so, um, and that just led to um, teaching, it was, it, I just fell into it and loved it. Arnold Toynbee in high school, that's pretty impressive. I don't think, who knows who that is, anybody? See, I do, but most people wouldn't. Uh, all right, Jen? Yeah, um, I also was a humanities person, loved history, and so um, went to college and uh, picked up a theology major along the way. And this is where my story gets a little bit confusing. Or, as far as call. Um, I actually had a teaching certificate, but went to seminary right outside of, um, right after um, college, and then um, thought about doing ministry uh, in a church setting. Um, and I got a phone call um, and uh, from a, a Christian school in North Carolina and ended up teaching there, but then continuing seminary and 
thinking to myself, okay, well, this is a good way to pay the bills um, while my husband finished um, undergrad. We got married super young, guys. It's crazy to think about. We were like, what, 20, 21, something. Um, and while my husband finished his undergrad degree, and I thought, well, I'll probably go into, um, into church ministry of some sort, uh, educational ministry. Um, so along that way, when I was, had been teaching a little after you guys, probably like four or five years into teaching, um, I, I was kind of wrestling with this question about whether to go into the church um, and work in ministry there or go into um, the school setting. And I actually had a student, um, phenomenal young lady, who I had taught in eighth and ninth grade, and then she had gone into high school, um, into public high school, and um, she was uh, in a car accident, tragically lost her life. And when I went to um, her funeral and the receiving line at uh, the funeral home, her parents reached out to me and said, oh, you're Mrs. Ritzema. She has so many things written in her Bible that she got from your classes. And um, then I went to this funeral and I got to hear about what a leader she was in her church. She did child evangelism program. And, um, and then the kids that she had influenced for the Lord in her public school. And I thought, well, this, this really is ministry, even though I'm in this Christian school setting. This is absolutely investing in this next generation um, is absolutely ministry. And so I felt after that secure in my call to be um, in the Christian school. Thank you. Yeah, I, so you do like an about, about me poster in kindergarten. And I put a picture of Mrs. Patch, who was my kindergarten teacher, of what I wanted to be when I was older. Um, so I've always been interested in school and education. Like my whole life, I thought I was going to be a teacher. Um, did I think I'd be teaching high school math? No. Um, until like later. But I've always loved school um, and my teachers, um, some more than others. But throughout the, <laughs> throughout the whole thing, um, I've always wanted to then go and do that myself, of like be one of those people that I loved when I was younger. Um, and so I like pursued that right away in college and just like continuing to work with um, students, like kids younger than me, kids who maybe are underserved. Um, I got to know them through foster care when I was growing up and then do different placements um, at school working in underserved um, communities and stuff like that. Um, I really felt called to like, yes, I can serve. I have these gifts to help um, and to work in these communities. Yeah, similar to Maddie, I was also in the same class uh, with Mrs. Patch, and we, we um, had a very similar view of education growing up, um, and both of us wanted to be teachers, so it's kind of cool that we both ended up doing that. Um, but yeah, um, growing up, I always wanted to be a teacher, always enjoyed working with children in different capacities, um, babysitting and things like that as I got older. Um, and then when I was in high school, um, I was able to do an internship at a local elementary school um, and it just kind of confirmed that that was what I wanted to do um, and then throughout college was able to have different experiences um, through my undergrad um, and then yeah so I just kind of I mean education in college is a pretty linear path like you do all the steps and then you get your license and um, along the way there were just different things that confirmed that that was what I wanted to do um, and so I had a very kind of simple straight trajectory with it um, but yeah Thank you. Well, why don't you, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your community contacts, your school, uh, your students uh, in particular, and kind of the unique opportunities and challenges that your setting presents, as well as maybe any other challenges just moving into education from a faith perspective, what that process was like, were there any particular struggles or challenges in integrating your faith with your education yourself? Um, so my school that I work at, it's a public charter school in Milwaukee, um, and most of the students, it's a Title I school, um, so most of the students in my school are low income, um, and many of them come from very broken families. Um, which has been interesting to see. Um, I went to Brookfield Christian growing up, so that was definitely different than what I had been raised around. Um, but yeah, it's been kind of interesting just to see how 
I have been able to use like my upbringing and like the foundation that I have in serving these kids that are have situations that are very different from what I grew up with. Um, many of the students that um, I work with have one or more parents who are incarcerated. Um, I have multiple students who were experiencing homelessness throughout the year. Um, and just, I have been able to be one of the stable adults in their life, um, which has been unique um, and presented me with kind of a cool opportunity to be able to build relationships with them. Um, a lot of them don't have trust in the adults that they work with, being from home experience or from having to move around a lot and just a lot of instability in their lives. Um, and though I can't necessarily always share very specifically that I'm a Christian with them, just being at a public school, um, I have been able to have different types of conversations with them um, and I don't know I think being able to be like uh, an example and like a model of uh, I'm not saying that I'm perfect in any way <laughs> but being able to be an adult that can be stable in their life um, has been really cool to see and especially now that we're nearing the end of the school year right the seeds that we plant in in September and October are now starting to kind of flourish at the end of the year so that's been cool. What am I supposed to talk about? <laughs> uh, the challenges? The particular challenges of your, okay. of your context. Sorry. And your that was a great the end of the year. We're really tired. Guys. I was like, I was just listening to your answer. Okay. Um, so high school math in a Christian school. Yeah. Does Christianity go with math? That's been like constant battle of my students. Why do we learn this? What does this have to do with this? Um, how do you fit Christianity into math? Um, in short, like, I don't love forcing Christian into math concepts of, like, we were talking about exponents. I don't know how much you know about exponents and logarithms, but, like, power from God to whatever. And I was like, kids have heard that. A lot of my students have heard, like, they come from Catholic families or Christian homes that they, like, have heard God, Jesus loves you, have heard that hammered into their lives. They don't need a forced Christian example in my math classroom of how God loves you in math. Um, so I think a lot of what I do um, from teaching from this Christian perspective um, is just like what kind of what Aaron was saying is being that example. Um, and then working with like high school students, I'm able to have different conversations with them. Um, so most of my students are, it's a choice school, St. Odd Prep, um, so majority of the students um, are part of the choice program and low income, um, but then come, they're mainly Hispanic, so they come from a lot of Catholic homes or Spanish-speaking homes and homes like that who grow up Catholic but don't necessarily know everything or have accepted that as their faith. Um, they just have heard it from their parents um, and go to church and stuff like that. But, so they're able to have those conversations with um, the teachers at, at my school, like with me. Um, we're able to talk about different things like that when we have time outside of learning math. Um, I mean, like I think of one specific example. I had a student who was upset because another teacher kicked him out of class. And I was like, well, she probably had a reason to kick you out of class. Like, you tend to talk a lot, you tend to do other things. He was like, but it was just rude. And like, we were able to go and talk about it. It's like, well, you need to respect people and like get into like why we have to respect people, why we have to act that way. Um, and like have those conversations about like your worth, your child of God and what that actually means when you live that out in like a school setting or even outside of school. Um, so I think like a lot of that of like putting the faith into action, like seeing that for students too and helping them to understand what that means in their lives. Like, it's great that you know Jesus loves you, but then what does that actually mean when you interact? And like being an example for that too um, in the math classroom or outside of that. Yeah, um, so I'll talk just broadly about Christian Ed because this is the fourth Christian school that I've taught at. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about particular BCS um, community. So I do think that um, one of the challenges just teaching in a Christian school is, um, like you're saying, like everybody, have you heard it before by the time they get to middle school and high school? And so um, I am finding, though, that 
in my years teaching, students do know way less about God's word or about faith in general. Um, we really are not seeing, um, I, I compare the beginning of my teaching career to um, last year, it, it's pretty incredible um, just how little of the faith even families who send their kids to Christian school um, no. So I think that continuing to do it well in the Christian school, um, continuing to be mindful of that it is a faith formation thing and that involves not just uh, teaching brains on a stick or, or coming up with, like you said, these uh, quick biblical integration things, but it's, it's really encompassing of how I think about how I view my students, how I view my time in my classroom, and, and how I am teaching them in every single aspect of what I do, and being mindful of that and being reflective of that. I think it's something that you can never do perfectly. Um, it's one of the challenges of teaching. You're always sort of thinking about how students are changing before you, the class you have in front of you. Um, so, so all of that. I think for BCS particularly, um, I, I really, I don't know, I, don't, I really love BCS probably more than any of the schools that I um, have taught of, taught at before. Um, that's great, it's recorded, hi. Anyway, but I, I just, I, you know, maybe because it was the start of my children's educational journey, because I was part of this church and got to see um, just the generations of, of sacrifice uh, for this school um, and how God has been faithful in the past to this school. And so I think in this context particularly, I'm mindful just um, how God is working in this community. I mean, I'm doing inclusion, um, working to have, uh, to broaden our um, students who we can serve in our school, and that's really exciting. Um, so just the way that God continues to move in that community and the connection between my faith community here and that school is a unique opportunity. So I think I'm just really mindful of doing that well um, in that context. So. I echo uh, some of the comments you made too as well, but I've taught in five different schools. I've been blessed in each one. I can kind of say whatever I want, and given what I teach, it's pretty easy to integrate faith and learning. Um, I mean, and yesterday we had our graduation. The speaker was a former head, and he started off with, a, we're creating the image of God, and, and because of that, we have dignity. And so I can, I can say that kind of stuff. Um, the challenge, I think, though, in, in a Christian school, you're assuming kids sort of understand all this. In many ways, they don't, but yeah. And, and uh, at a school, at a non-sectarian, you know, uh, private school, you're assuming that they know nothing, and a lot of them know almost nothing about Christianity. There's a good number of Christians, but um, we really, the culture has changed significantly. Um, much more secular, and I think uh, the, the kids who are Christians are very quiet, um, and they're not because they know they're in a minority. So that uh, that, and along with relativism, I think is is totally growing among Christians and non-Christians in our culture. And, and um, I had some good heart-to-heart -heart talks with students this year about that. Just. Uh, asking them questions and kind of challenging that relativistic perspective. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I mean, I, I echo some of that as well. And, you know, Marquette is Catholic University. Uh, I'm not sure always what that means. Um, you know, that, that division between Christian and non-Christian, again, it's not really distinct sometimes. And, you know, teaching theology at Marquette, you know, it's, it's not a secular university, so, but it's also not exactly what you would call a Christian university either. Uh, it's a mixture of elements. And so a, a place like Marquette, I mean, at least gives me the green light to, you know, open the door to certain kinds of conversations that typically wouldn't be possible at a secular school if I was teaching in Madison or something. Uh, but the student body is <laughs> wide ranging and some students are active in their faith uh, that would be the minority. Some are have nominal Christian or Catholic uh, beliefs. Uh, not, not really beliefs, it's almost like more of just their culture. Uh, 
Some have left that behind. They've been the same students that some of you see who have been told this all their life. And by the time they get to high school, they're kind of done with it. And so a lot of them even come um, as agnostics or atheists. And then I get students from all kinds of other religions as well. They're not the dominant note, but they are, they're growing um, at Marquette. And so uh, the place opens the door to conversations, but the student body is probably closer in similarity to a secular university than to a Christian one. Um, and I definitely echo what you've been saying too about it's changing out there. <laughs> Uh, even in the last decade, it's changed dramatically. And the amount of knowledge that, that I can assume even these ki people as college kids know about the Bible, just super basic stuff, or even about Christianity, even the, the folks that supposedly grew up in some kind of Christian or Catholic context, they almost never really know anything. <laughs> and they, if they know something about Christianity, it's usually a very misconceived idea about what Christianity is. So, um, so that's a challenge. Um, I'd forgotten actually, I did teach high school. Uh, it was a long time ago, for one year. Um, I didn't really tell my story, but I, I, I went to seminary in the, back in the 80s. I was always intending to teach and kind of got sidetracked by a number of things and ended up working in technology for 15 years. Uh, but when I was in seminary, I had a year where I taught at a startup. Uh, very small high school. It was interesting. But I ended up going back. I ended up at Marquette because I went and did my PhD there back in 2005. And thought we'd be moving somewhere, but we ended up just kind of staying here. And now it's kind of worked out that I've been able to teach at Marquette full time, and that is good. Uh, but, you know, I think. Uh, I think we should just open it up and just see what kind of questions you guys have. I don't think I have a wandering mic. Uh, Bruce. Oh, Bruce. Maybe I'll. Uh, so if you guys got questions for the panel or for me, um, let's hear some of your thoughts and questions. And, and my educators in here, if you've got other things you want to add to the conversation, by all means, do that as well. <laughs> If you could enact one policy or change that all schools would have to follow that would make them, make the students better people and better, not necessarily better Christians, because a lot of them are at, not, aren't at Christian schools, but what would you do to improve education? I think that's a bit of a loaded question. <laughs> There's many things I can think of. Um, I would say one thing that I have noticed specifically with the group of students that I work with, um, we use something called SEL, which is social emotional learning. Um, and what we are finding is there are many students who do learn skills at home to be able to like function in society, like how to name and manage their emotions, like how to be able to be respectful to others, how to um, like be able to like read a room and understand like how they're like how they are impacting the other people in that space. Um, and there are some communities that don't really put a lot of value in that. Um, and I think that would be something that I wish all schools and all students had access to were the resources and the skills to be able to um, understand kind of what they're going through and then be able to positively be able to deal with those emotions. Um, especially we have a lot of students and a lot of kids who don't really have a lot of adults that model that well for them. Um, and that is both in secular and in Christian settings, unfortunately. Like, the, you know, there are some kids who don't have like a positive model of that. And those skills need to be taught um, for a lot of kids. And so I wish that all kids had access to that. You don't know the answers, whoever wants to. Well, I'm all into, I think, understanding history, understanding the economic way of thinking. Uh, I wish all schools would have kids understand the Constitution. I wouldn't mandate it. I don't, I, I don't think you should mandate anything in schools. But, uh, but I would also love to see universal choice. I mean, to, to allow children to attend any school, I think that would be the very best thing we could do to um, improve education and help society. 
think like not even just a choice program, but a choice within schools or like within the school of like allowing students to choose what they like want to study. Like if you're never going to need math, like if you're planning to just go do something else, I think students would take more control of their learning if they had more control of it. Like if they were able to choose more what they wanted to do in school and what they wanted to learn, I think they would be able to be more invested and then be able to apply those skills that they're learning because they want to learn those to what they're able to do then in the future. Others? Who are you? <laughs> I'm just curious what effect you saw COVID have on your schools. I student taught. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I was like, I student taught during COVID year, so I was actually in New Mexico um, at Rehoboth Christian, and they did like all virtual learning. Um, and we like came in like one day a week. Um, and I think that's just like, but now seeing the aftermath of like full time teaching now with these students that learn during COVID of like just like, yeah, interact, social interaction skills, I think we're lacking and they're very quick to hide behind a computer and would much rather be behind that screen than like interact with me or somebody else. Um, they're much more comfortable on a computer than I think other students had been and would rather or prefer that a lot of my students would then actually talking to me face to face. I think one of the, right when we came back from, um, from being virtual, it was one of the most intense years for students with conflict with each other. Um, it was almost like nor that normal adjustment to middle school was truncated. And so it, it was super, in like, super intense. So I see a lot of relational um, issues, a lot of increase in anxiety. Um, and that would probably be the biggest stuff that I saw right off the bat. Um, we, the school I taught at was a little less impacted by COVID. They went back earlier than, um, than some schools that remained online. So even with that, though, I saw a difference for sure. Echo everything. Our school went back earlier as well. Um, I, uh, but I think it was just positively awful in terms of the effects in all sorts of ways. And hope that we never have to do anything like that again. Yeah, you know, it was an interesting social experiment, if nothing else. I mean, I mean, really, to, to see how that kind of isolation from each other and face-to-face -face contact and reliance on just technology to tie us together or social media or something, hey, that's, that's not the same. And that kind of human contact is what we all desire and what brings us health. And those were awful years. And I still see the aftermath of that. Um, and I never saw more mental health issues than I saw in the last couple of years. And, and Marquette's a pretty, you know, secure place. It's not like these are mostly people who are challenged. Um, well, we can take maybe one more question. Can I just add, I just wanted to add to that last question. Um, I would say too, like, um, COVID impacted different communities differently, um, which I think is important to recognize. Like, we have a lot of schools like in the area that were really able to bounce back in sort of in a different way. Um, but there are many schools and many communities that like did not have the resources available. Um, and so COVID is still very, very, very much impacting the way that a lot of our students are living life every day um, and like a lot of milestones especially in I mean in all aspects of education but thinking about those younger students like many of those milestones like being able to sit on the carpet and like being able to learn how to jump rope like I was joking with a colleague the other day my fourth graders don't know how to jump rope because when they were virtual, they were in first grade. And so they didn't get that skill, like those gross motor skills. And so we're seeing like delays in certain things. Um, but also I had four kids come to me not knowing how to write their name in third grade. And like that is a direct impact of like COVID, but also that the community of my students didn't get the same resources as everybody else. I think now we probably are out of time. Uh, but thank you all for coming. You know, one other thing we didn't talk about today was uh, actually educating adults 
uh, we're talking more about the kind of traditional education, but just to remind her, I mean, education is a lifelong thing. All of you, I hope, are lifelong learners. And uh, the role of teaching adults has a, a different set of challenges, but you know, we're doing adult education right now, right? Uh, and that's very valuable and I think helps us all to continue to grow throughout life. Uh, but thank you all, have a good summer.